At the time of this recording, Q1 2025 is over. Time really does fly and I think it's a good time to recap all of the flagship chipsets that we have for this generation in particular. And we only have the Dimensity 9400 from MediaTek and a few variations of the Snapdragon 8 Elite. Disappointingly enough, the Exynos 2500 is a no-show as news reports claim that Samsung Foundry had a low yield rate. Maybe we'll see it in the Galaxy Z Flip 7 or the Z Fold 7. Who knows, but uh, we will definitely get into testing with those chipsets if it eventually comes out. Anyway, the reason why we're doing this video right now is that I think both the Dimensity 9400 and the Snapdragon 8 Elite chipsets had enough time to mature. I mean, if we think about it, they've been out in the market for like more than six months or so. Yeah. So this video is purely based on our testing and we hope to have included enough information as much as possible, I hope. So please do like and subscribe as we had to break our brains into how we can make sense of all of this data in a properly comparable manner. And that is why it took us so long to get this video sorted out and get it out to you guys to watch. So yeah, uh, do like and subscribe. That really, really does mean a lot to me. So in this video, we have to list all of the devices that we have tested as shown on the screen here. And most of the devices here are using the standard octa-core version of the Snapdragon 8 Elite, except for one device. The Samsung Galaxy S25 series is using the Snapdragon 8 Elite 4 Galaxy with a few tweaks to its clock speeds, while the Oppo Find N5 is using a 7-core version of the Snapdragon 8 Elite. It was silently announced and we didn't have any information available other than just a small footnote on Qualcomm's webpage. So this video will be split into three major parts. The first one is purely talking about the performance of the phones that we got to test and then the heat they produce and finally we're gonna talk about the efficiency and also the battery life for that matter. So let's get started by talking about the performance first. There are lots to talk about and thanks to this new tool that we're using, the VTool Scene, we can get much more data out of the gaming tests that we usually do. This app can record a bunch of data but somehow cannot be exported to a CSV file for further analysis so we can only rely on the data as shown on these screenshots here. We chose Xenozone 0 at the highest graphical settings fighting against the flower boss because it is the most repeatable test that lasts long enough to fully stress the device. Because some phones can last for a very long time, I did this test a total of 3 times back to back for each device. That means I fought this boss for more than 30 times, including some of the retests. So, uh, yeah, I, I literally spent the whole day just fighting this boss. Starting off the render resolution. Unfortunately, there is no actual way to verify what the V2 scene actually reports. So the only answer that we have is via Samsung devices, as One UI has something called GPU Watch that also shows the render resolution. It seems to be working great too. So with that in mind, we can plot our first graph, the total amount of pixels that the GPU has to draw for the game. It doesn't really show us much since the render resolution is just, you know, the resolution of the game. Here comes the second graph, showing the average FPS throughout the fights for all three rounds for each phone. However, this graph is quite misleading in its own because it doesn't take the render resolution into account. And then we have to calculate something called the pixel throughput by multiplying the render resolution with the FPS. And here is the third graph showing the pixel throughput for all three rounds for each phone. Some phones do not have a second and third round because the phone already hit its thermal limit during the first round. So I just didn't bother testing second and third times. Now, in gaming, having above or equal to 45 FPS is equal to quote-unquote smooth. And since VTOL scene also captures this data, we can put the smoothness percentage across all three rounds and here is the fourth graph. It is normal for the smoothness percentage to drop as it goes to the second or third rounds as the phones will slowly thermal throttle the performance instead of having just one big dip. That is actually something that I realized in the current generation because each of them have like 
a gradual thermal throttle, kind of. I don't really know how to explain this, but if you look at the graph, then you will know. This kind of smoothness percentage dip across one round to another can signify that thermal throttling has happened. It is also within this graph that we can see certain devices like the ROG Phone 9 and the ROG Phone 9 FE can maintain really good consistency throughout all three tests while every other phone dropped off drastically. Now comes the fifth graph, temperature. It's once again very normal for the temperature to rise from one round to another, but if the temperature stays about the same and has horrible frame rates, that means thermal throttling has happened too. While I do believe way too many companies are constantly shouting about how big of a cooling system they have on their phone, they will thermal throttle eventually, and that is why we did a total of 3 tests for this game. Most of the phones here are throttled during the first and second rounds, while only 2 phones managed to survive all 3 rounds, and that is the ROG Phone 9 and the ROG Phone 9 FE. The ROG Phone series is made for gaming in mind, and they have the chipset placed around the middle of the phone with the heat sinks and whatnot, and the results really does speak for itself. It really does work. But remember, we haven't even put on the Aero Active Cooler X Pro yet. But that is a topic for another day because all the phones as shown in this list here are cooled passively. So no fans, just relying on the environment. And now comes the efficiency. One of the reasons why we keep doing the gaming test for the same chipset on different phones is because the cooling system can be different and the way power is delivered to those chipsets can be vastly different as well. And here is the sixth graph, the average wattage across all devices for all three rounds. The wattage is like the source of everything in this case. Higher wattage means higher performance, but also more heat. Once it hits the thermal limit, thermal throttling starts, and that's when the performance drops, and finally the wattage also drops. And that is why you can see the power consumption drops from the first round to the second, and then to the third. One phone that maintained a high wattage throughout all three rounds is the ROG Phone 9 FE with the Snapdragon 8 Gen 3. Not the ROG Phone 9 with the Snapdragon 8 Elite, mind you. It is here that we can finally get the answer to why the Galaxy S25 series heated up so quickly. For some reason, bro thinks that they are the ROG Phone 9 series and just push 8 watts to the chip during the first round. Of course, it couldn't survive that much wattage and just thermal throttled within a few short minutes. I'm not sure how Samsung tuned the Snapdragon 8 Elite for Galaxy, but it is quite detrimental for sustained high performance demands like gaming. Now, remember the pixel throughput data that we had earlier? If we redo the calculation by including the average power, we can get the average wattage per pixel throughput. And this kind of determines how efficient it takes to draw one pixel on the screen hence this seventh graph. It's an abstract calculation, but it's the only way that we can make sense as the render resolution across all devices are different. We are only taking the first round here as the second and third round doesn't make sense since most phones have already throttled. I do suspect that these data are kind of misleading as the Oppo Find N5, while Unfolded had the best result, but the gameplay was absolutely horribly laggy because it only supplied 3.4 watts for that many pixels. Anyway, for this graph, the lower the number, the better, as it signifies less wattage required to draw one pixel. We can see that the POCO F7 Ultra, if we did disable Joyos, which is, I think, a horrible idea, we will get into that later, is the worst in terms of gaming efficiency. The second worst in gaming efficiency is the Galaxy S25 series. Again, the Snapdragon 8 Elite for Galaxy pumps way too much power to the chip, and it's great for short bursts of performance, but it's not good for sustained performance like gaming. The Dimensity 9400 is actually the third here, as it pumps too much power to the chip as well. Though I have to say, we don't have enough devices to actually test the Dimensity 9400 properly, to make any solid conclusions. So consider this to be a liquid conclusion. <laughs> Again, different phones will have different tuning as the amount of power pushed to the chip will also be different, hence this graph. So one comment that I always see when we do any gaming test for Xiaomi, Redmi or Poco devices is 
joyous. It's MIUI's and HyperOS's system app that controls how much power the chip gets. So here's a special graph showing you the average power per pixel throughput for the POCO F7 Ultra with and without Joyos. Without Joyos, it's really bad. It's just the worst that I've seen. It's so bad that it became the most inefficient phone in this entire test. With Joyos enabled though, it becomes pretty good. Not the best, but a whole lot better. If we look at the temperature and wattage, yeah, it's no surprise why the POCO F7 Ultra became so hot with Joyos turned off. It pumps once more way too much power to the chip, hence becoming super hot. You do get better frame rates for a short while and it's not sustainable. There are other phones with such limiters in place as well, like Samsung with the game optimizing service, aka the GOS. A lot of commenters say that disabling it will be better, but I think it's just a horrible idea. If you do disable it, then the phone will push even more wattage to the chip and you do get better frame rates for a short while, but overheating and thermal throttling will be inevitable and it's just bad. GOS will help you to control the wattage to make sure you get better performance for a longer period of time. So that's how the GOS actually works. Another thing that I would like to show you is the battery consumption. Since we have a standardized battery life test by locking the brightness at 100 nits brightness and running it through the PC Mark 10 battery life test, we can directly compare the efficiency of these phones. I'm not taking the resolution into consideration because it doesn't actually affect the battery life that much. However, these phones do have a vastly varying amounts of battery capacity. So if we look at this graph where we normalize the battery consumption per hour, the MAH per hour value, then we can surprisingly see that the small Galaxy S25 has the best efficiency out of all. It could be due to a smaller screen, but the second place goes to the ROG Phone 9 FE running on the Snapdragon 8 Gen 3. Comparing it with the ROG Phone 9 with the Snapdragon 8 Elite, yeah, it confirms my suspicion that the 8 Gen 3 is just more efficient when we are not gaming. We have a solid answer now. Surprisingly, both the OnePlus 13 and the Oppo Find X8 Pro, which I consider them to be cousins, have almost the same level of efficiency. MediaTek really did improve a lot to be on par with the 8 Elite this generation. So what does this all mean? Why am I doing all of these tests and eventually leading up to this video? Well, to show you that the current state of chipsets for this generation and also to clear some doubts that I share with you all. What I wholeheartedly believe is that there is no quote-unquote best chipset in the world right now. However, there are certain phones that are just tuned to supply the appropriate amount of wattage to a phone and the phone to be physically designed to handle the chip properly. This applies to gaming and not gaming as well. Competition is also important in the world of chipsets. As we can see, the MediaTek Dimensity 9400 is really good this generation and I really do hope that they can surpass Qualcomm soon. Samsung shouldn't also give up on their Exynos as AMD GPUs in those phones are just plain superb compared to other chipsets GPU. Also Qualcomm, please, if you're going to release a 7-core version of the Snapdragon 8 Elite, please make it as public as possible. Don't just put it as a footnote on the product page and Oppo should have also displayed that it is using the 7-core version of the 8 Elite on the phone's about page, not hiding it in the products spec sheet on their website. Why are you trying to sweep this under the rug? Because I think it's kind of misleading if you just talk as though that it is using the 8-core version. But what I'm most curious about is that more and more phone brands are introducing an additional chip to bring more features like upscalers and frame interpolation. I believe that these phone brands, even Qualcomm themselves, know that the raw chipset performance is just not sustainable. iQ13 had introduced a chip called the Q2 core processor. While we have zero idea on what it actually does, it does help in certain games. The recently launched POCO F7 Ultra also comes with something called the Vision Boost D7 chipset that Xiaomi claims can upscale the game and interpolate it to 120fps. 
but we've shown it in another video that the upscaler doesn't seem to change anything but to sharpen the image a little bit and the frame interpolation seems to be just MEMC. Even the power consumption with or without these features are about the same so there is no real benefit there. What I am looking forward to are true upscalers and frame generation like what NVIDIA DLSS has. These technologies are already here for your phone actually. Qualcomm introduced something called the Snapdragon Gaming Super Resolution 2 which is an upscaler and games made with Unreal Engine can already implement this into their games. However, we have yet to see any actual games in the market that uses this technology. The Snapdragon 8 Elite also has something called the Adreno Frame Motion Engine 2.0, a frame interpolator, but again, no phone brand has implemented it as a default feature on their phones. Heck, even ARM, the company who designed the instruction set that our devices use nowadays, has developed something called ARM Accuracy Super Resolution that is available for all game developers to use today and the plugin for Unreal Engine and Unity Engine are also coming later this year. Again, we will have to stay tuned to see what games actually implement this technology. I mean, think about it. If our phones have upscalers, then it can actually just render at 720p, upscale it to 1080p or even higher. And on our phone screens, I don't really mind if the graphics look a bit blurry or over sharpened because it's just a phone screen anyway, it's small. Plus, it will be lower in power consumption, hence lowering the heat, extending the battery life and also the battery's lifespan. That means we get to play for a longer period of time. Who doesn't want that? So as of now, I'm excited to see what's next as these upscaler technologies start to make its way into the world of mobile gaming. Maybe we'll see it taking shape in the later half of 2025 or early 2026. I mean, we're going to Computex 2025, ARM, MediaTek and Qualcomm will be there too. Perhaps it's a good time to ask them what's up with these new technologies. So let me know what do you think about all of these technologies and any parts of this video. I'd love to know your thoughts, so do leave them down in the comment section below. Hit that subscribe button and also like this video as well because it really took us a long time to put this together. And uh, yeah, we will have more gaming tests and whatnot coming soon. So stay tuned for all of that and we'll see you guys in the next video.